Some of us amongst the community, we tend to commit and we tend to get addicted to as well, unfortunately. So Abu Musa will be talking about the, the causes for these particular addictions and also the solutions as well to try and come out of these things. So a bit about our brother Abu Musa, he's the co-founder of an organization called My Tazkia. Now, My Tazkia is a recovery program for different harmful addictions. And he has many years of experience in working with addicts and has conducted extensive research on people watching inappropriate videos, especially amongst the Muslim communities. He's got a degree in BSc Biomedic Biomedical Science and has been involved with mental health studies exploring different therapeutic interventions such as CBT and psychotherapy. Abu Musa has also worked as a teacher and youth worker, also counsellor as well. And he's the liaison with um, he's a liaison with the street uh, active young people, helping them to recover from drugs and alcohol. So without further ado, I'll give you our brother Abu Musa. If we can try and say the questions for the end. And if, any, if any sisters have got questions, then we then they can write it down on, some, on, uh, on a piece of paper, and then we'll collect them, inshallah. So, without further ado, I'll give you Abu Musa. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah khair. Jazakallah khair for the introduction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. I uh, just wanted to thank Brother Harun and uh, you brothers at Nottingham Islam for allowing us to come and talk about this subject of uh, the problem of addiction because uh, unfortunately it's very difficult to talk about these topics and a lot of us within the Muslim communities we shy away from these subjects because they are tough subjects it's not easy to talk about these issues but you know addictions they like fungi you know they thrive on the secrecy the isolation and they grow in the dark so when you shine light on fungus it stops growing so likewise that's what we are trying to do at my Tazkiyah um, so I'd like to thank the brothers over here so inshallah <coughs> I'll start off with uh, the lecture so this problem of addiction uh, you know of um, watching inappropriate images videos is a two-level problem see number one is the lack of prevention and number two is the lack of cure so alhamdulillah what we are doing here right now is working on the prevention aspect and it is very important and like i said you know a lot of us within the muslim communities we rather brush these uh things under the carpet because it's easier that way and it's difficult to deal with them head on even for us at my tazkiyah myself it took me years to be able to come out and talk about these topics but um it's because you know this is why these addictions are growing so much because we are not talking about them and we are not warning our children about these issues we are not talking about it within our messages within our homes within our communities because uh, we'll warn our children about drugs about alcohol but these issues you know online addictions we will not talk about it and we will not warn them about it but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran he's warned us about the uh, effects of intoxicants and he's told us about this fitna in fact the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he's mentioned that this is the biggest fitna left behind for men this fitna of uh, lust or inappropriate uh, addictions so um, I apologize in advance because it is a sensitive topic and uh, Brother Harun did mention there's youngsters here as well and we do want to get the message across to the youngsters as well but we want to like I want to kind of travel in the middle ground and be careful with my words so apologies um, in advance so you see we have to start talking about these topics 
uh, within our homes. Fathers have to start talking about these issues to their sons. Mothers have to start talking about these things to their daughters. Say, you know, oh my daughter or my son, if you see an explicit image come up on your laptop, on your phone, when you're doing your assignment or you are surfing the web, what will you do? A. Are you going to click on this pop-up image? B. Are you going to close this window? Or C. Are you going to tell me about it? Your parent, you know, your mother or your father about it. And what we want to work towards is C. We want the children to get comfortable and we want the parents to get comfortable to talk about these subjects and the children be able to, you know, tell them that, you know, Dad, Mom, this is what I've seen online. And uh, let's do something about it. Yeah, and one of the things that I can suggest that always whenever I go and talk about these subjects, I say that everyone can do this, inshallah. All you brothers and sisters over here in this uh, center and everyone online as well, you can download fil filters and everyone, every home should have these filters in place. You know, the one thing you can do is go to your internet provider and block all adult content from your internet provider. So everything coming to your home will be blocked, inshallah. And beyond that, you need to, you know, it's multi-level protection. There's um, apps, there's filters, such as one is called Custodio, Q-U-S-T-O-D-I-O. If anyone wants to know, you can come to me after the talk and I can tell you more about it. There's Custodio and there's Covenant Eyes and there's other ones. And these basic filters are very strong. So Custodio, we recommend a lot. You'll have the parent version. On, uh, in your app so the, the father or the mother can have the parent version of the app and you can install the kids version onto the children's app and you can you know it's a paid service but it's not that expensive it's well worth protecting your children's fitra and you know their natural disposition from these issues and you can put up to five devices so you can lock all the devices and then you it'll block all content all adult content and beyond that it will you can also restrict the amount of time children spend on on certain apps amount of data they use and you'll see everything that they are visiting so that will create that strong accountability aspect and awareness and this is what we do at my Taskiya. a lot of the recovery there's two parts to recovery accountability and awareness keeping you know the brothers and sisters who are suffering from these addiction making them accountable and keeping them aware because there's these industries out there, unfortunately, multi-billion dollar industries, they study the psyche, the psychology of humans, and they do things in certain ways to trap people when they're young. A lot of these pop-ups you'll see on uh, children's websites, cartoon websites, free movie websites. So, you know, they know what they are doing, and they are very proactive, these industries. So we can no longer, as a Muslim community, or as society uh, as a whole, we can no longer be reactive. We have to be proactive, inshallah. And that's why sometimes these difficult conversations and these words have to be expressed. So there's that aspect, there's a lack of prevention. And we at my Taski are trying to do that because we can only do so much with the people, you know, the, level, the other level I was talking about, helping people with uh, curing this problem. And it's because of age restrictions, it's difficult to deal with a younger audience. But for that, we have our socials, you know, YouTube, our blogs, uh, Instagram, and these things. And that's where we're trying to work on the prevention aspect of things. But we need to do this as, as an ummah, as in a community as a whole, inshallah. And just um, before I move on to um, the other part of the, the lack of cure, I just want to mention some statistics, inshallah. So, the financial cost to business productivity in the US alone because of this addiction is estimated at 16.9 billion annually. According to National Coalition for the Protection of Children and Families, and this was in 2010, 11 years ago, 47% of families in the United States reported that this problem is a problem in their home. You know, pornography use has incre increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. So you're more than three times more likely to um, cheat on your spouse or these kind of things. 40% of people identified as addicts lose their spouses. They end up having a divorce. 58% suffer considerable financial losses and about 33% lose their jobs. 68% of divorce cases involve one party meeting a new paramour over the internet. While 56% involve one party having an obsessive interest in these websites. And, you know, 
across the board this goes with other addictions as well and that's where I'm going to talk about the science behind this addiction and the problems so the lack of cure here you know addictions whether it's drug addiction alcohol addiction food addiction whatever addiction you see an addiction the description of an addiction is something that you are using to escape reality yeah so you know you you use it and you use it so much times so that it becomes you know an addiction and that's how it develops you use this thing to escape your problems your stresses and your anxieties from your day-to-day -day life that is i can give like a brief introduction or definition of addiction and um i describe it like an iceberg you know an iceberg on the top of the water right you see these problems it could be drugs alcohol weed food addiction pornography addiction beyond that zina subhanallah and these are the roots towards these evils but that's not the main problem the problem is beneath the waters and the much larger part of the iceberg you see the iceberg the smaller part is above the water but the much larger part of the iceberg is normally beneath the water and this is what you have to deal with in therapy counseling or um, you know these kind of uh, things that you get involved in with recovery those are the problems you need to tackle and those problems are underlying mental health issues what we've experienced at Maritaskia it could be stress general anxiety you know it could be trauma it is the conditioning you know the negative thinking patterns negative uh, traits and so on that people are suffering from or there's another common thing two aspects that we see with addicts one is underlying mental health issues and second is they have a distorted relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Although, like many brothers or sisters, you'll see, we are dealing with huffad, imams, du'at, people, you know, uh, studying and so on, from all different backgrounds, and practicing people that are going to the masjid and frequenting prayer and so on, but they are still suffering from these problems. So that's where we try to delve deeper because it is a, an, an, a, a spiritual problem, but it's also an emotional problem. So that for the emotional side of things, you deal with the mental health aspects. And the spiritual side of things, you work on your deen, your iman, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what we have to realize is that the Prophet said that every one of us has been assigned a qareen. We all have a qareen that whispers to us. Yeah, in the Quran it's mentioned in Surah Nas that Nas, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions الَّذِي يَوَسْوِسُ فِي سَدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ Those who whisper in the hearts of men from amongst mankind, from amongst the jinn kind and the mankind. Yes, so we have the qareen. Then we have our nafs. And then we have Iblis. And then we have the, the environment. Right? Because it said that uh, those who whisper from amongst the jinn kind and mankind. Yeah, you have these industries. Right? So you have a lot of enemies out there. So this is what, you know, we, we say that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can protect you and guide you out of this hole. Yeah, and there's a hadith um, of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where he says the devil circulates inside the son of Adam like blood circulates in him. And there's another hadith which mentions that the devil, yeah, iblis, places his halter on the heart of the son of Adam. When the son of Adam remembers Allah, he flees. Yeah, but when the son of Adam forgets Allah subhanahu wa taala, he swallows his heart. Subhanallah. So these are the things that we talk about in recovery. Um, so I will touch on the solutions more, but also just to give a brief understanding um, of addiction again. The analogy I give is that imagine a fisherman going to fish in the river, right? So he's by the river and he's catching fish and he has to put the fishing line to catch the fish. So this fisherman is the inner addict yeah so a person who's suffering from drug addiction uh, weed addiction alcohol addiction uh, pornography addiction imagine they have this inner addict we all have this qareen as well so that fisherman is the inner addict and he has to put a fishing line inside the river to catch the fish and that fish is the addict yeah that is us and the fish won't be attracted towards that fishing line unless there's a bait there has to be a bait for that fish to be attracted to the fishing line and that's how it gets hooked and caught yeah so this fisherman is the inner addict you can say the qareen you know just 
but basically, you know, you could use different words for it. Then the, the, the fish is the human, the addict, and it needs this trap. So what is the bait in the case of addiction? The bait in the case of addiction, again, is these underlying issues. Stress, anxiety, resentment, jealousy, our conditioning. You know, these problems that we want to escape. Yeah. And when you have these drugs that have this very abnormal release of dopamine, so weed, you know, imagine like, you know, a brief um, description of dopamine. It's a very powerful, does anyone know what dopamine is? Can anyone explain just a brief example? Anything? So basically, it's like this chemical in the brain, right? And it's released, it is a survival hormone. It helps us to, to go out to work. It helps us to, uh, you know, motivates us to provide for our families. You know, you release dopamine when you complete tasks. You release dopamine when you eat food. You release dopamine when you're intimate with your spouse. Yeah, but what happens is a natural, God-given, um, you know, thing, a survival hormone uh, within us, alhamdulillah. But there's this perversion that takes place. So, you know, to give a brief example or simple example, you release dopamine or excessive dopamine when we eat chocolate, when we drink fizzy drinks. You know, if you have an energy drink, you're releasing, uh, you know, excessive dopamine. And that's why these things are dangerous. Sometimes these are the starting points of addiction. Coffee, excessive dopamine release. But when you come to things like drugs, there's a very abnormal dopamine release. When we're talking about pornography, drugs, alcohol, there's a very abnormal dopamine release. And this is why you see drug addicts, they will have these crushes, these mood swings right and they will be suffering they will be chasing that next high you know like a heroin addict he's always they say he's always chasing that first high so likewise with these issues you want more and more and more to feel that same hit and unfortunately that's what happens with dopamine there's this depletion that takes place because it's like again to simplify it it's like we wake up in the morning and we only have a certain amount of dopamine yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this in creation. So if you go throughout your day, you work, you'll be content, you'll be happy, you know, you go work out, you release a bit more endorphins, you these feel good hormones, and you're content and you won't feel these crashes. But imagine you wake up and you have, uh, you know, smoke weed. You've released that dopamine that was supposed to last you the whole day. So obviously you're going to feel that high, that buzz, likewise with these other issues. You're going to feel that buzz, but a couple of hours later, you're going to have that crash. You know, wherever there's a high, there's always a greater low. And then you're going to feel that crash, and you're going to feel low, and then you're going to get angry. You're going to get irritable. You're going to get stressful. And this is why they say addicts, uh, not everyone, but again, in our experience, we've seen that addicts tend to have a weaker stress response. Because imagine they've been introduced to these drugs, the inappropriate material online, and that online stuff is called the new drug. It's like called the online crack cocaine because um, you know there's studies that have been conducted and they've seen someone watching this online material and someone taking heroin and they're saying the similar effects in the brain are taking place. Subhanallah. So imagine someone is being introduced to this issue at 12, 13, 14 and they get used to this thing that is giving them an extreme feeling of high. So now when they're feeling stressful when they are going through issues at school, they're going through bullying maybe, or tough times at exam, or domestic violence at home, whatever it may be, they're going through difficult times. Where do you think the brain is going to direct them towards? It's going to direct them towards pleasure. This is the brain. You see, the brain is a very lazy organ. The brain will go towards desires, and it wants ease. It doesn't like difficulty. So again, it will direct a person towards this drug that they've seen. When they're feeling low, they can get this sense of high immediately. And this is where the trouble starts. This is where the addiction develops. And this is why it's very important for us to work on the prevention aspect of things and get comfortable talking to our children about these issues. So um, there's actually parts, you know, so if we were to talk about the science of the brain, there's parts of the brain called the amygdala and prefrontal cortex, right? the amygdala and prefrontal cortex and this is where a lot of uh, our emotions and thought processes work so you know one of the parts of the brain is where the thoughts come and this could be closely related to our qareen so these thoughts you know they say we get 
thousands and thousands of thoughts per day. So we really have to start focusing on these thought, this thought process. Slow it down. What are these thoughts that are coming? And you know, uh, basically throughout, they're bombarding us throughout our day. And then the other part of the brain converts these thoughts into emotions. Yeah. So you know when you're feeling stressed and you're feeling angry and you're feeling anxious, there's always a preceding thought. You don't, emotion cannot exist without a thought process. Yeah? So there's always a thought process, ta thought process taking place that ends up becoming an emotion. And this is where a lot of our conditioning lives, between our thought processes and our emotions. So you know, as children we develop and we go through adolescence, and this is where our personality develops. You know, this is where our ability to deal with stress, our emotional intelligence, our emotional maturity develops. And this is where, of course, you know, our Qareen, the Shaitan, he wants to manipulate these parts of the brain. He wants to attack us. Because ultimately, what is the mission of Iblis, of the Qareen? They want to destroy us. They want us depressed. They want us anxious. They want, you know, because this, you know, that road towards destruction. Like you see a lot of people, uh, when they're involved in the Rukya, and uh, the jinn is speaking, and they say, why are you in the body of this person? And they say, to destroy him. You know, we have been sent by someone to destroy this person, to create these mental health issues within him, you know, to depress him, to make him suicidal. Yeah, may Allah protect us all. I mean, but um, this is the mission. This is what is going on. So, but we have to really start focusing on these aspects as well, both parts, and start working on this conditioning, right? Start working on um, our emotional and, uh, and spiritual issues. You know, because this is one of the best things you can do for yourself, for your, for the single Muslims out there, for your future spouse, or for the brothers, you know, who are married, for your wife, for your children, to be a better father, to be a better mother, to be a better, um, you know, community member, is work on these aspects. And it's directly re related to our deen. You know, I believe all the solutions of the mental health issues are in the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah, but we just have to get involved. Uh, in these things and work on your you know become emotionally and spiritually healthy is one of the best gifts you can give to yourself and to your family so um, to go on to some of the solutions that um, sorry brothers there's just a few notes I want to make sure I, I get this uh, points across because they are the fundamentals of the problem and solution so you know again with addicts that we see there's this inner conflict taking place. There's this inner war. And that's why we emphasize, you see, when, when someone goes to a therapist, when someone goes to the Imam, or look, a lot of us, a lot of people, uh, Muslims come from Jahiliya. They come from backgrounds of drug addiction, alcohol addiction, uh, or all kinds of things. And a lot of uh, Muslims, you know, revert brothers and sisters from all different backgrounds, yeah? We come from this baggage uh, sometimes. Yeah, and alhamdulillah, Allah guides. Allah is the one who guides, right? And this is why the dua, just to remind myself and you all, we should read this dua daily. Ya muqallib al qulub, sabit qulub ala ala dini, qalbi ala dini, right? Oh, controller of hearts, keep our hearts firm on the deen. Right? This is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make this dua. So who are we? We should make this dua daily and not take uh, things for granted. Yeah? Hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa taala, never to take it for granted. But we come to Islam, and alhamdulillah, one of the biggest things that we can do, uh, you know, powerful things is to follow the Sunnah. Yeah? Like my personal experience, I was around the wrong crowd, right? A lot of us growing in the West, all the Muslim countries, um, it's difficult sometimes, right? You might end up with the wrong crowd. One of the things that helped me get away from that crowd is because I tried to leave that crowd and start practicing Islam, you know, 10, 12 years ago, but it was difficult. I'll maybe get dragged into that crowd again. But one of the things that really helped me is to follow the sunnah, you know, to grow the lahya, to grow the beard, to wear a thawb, and these kind of things, because they become like a natural repellent, right? They keep that evil away from you, subhanAllah, because I remember, may Allah bless them, alhamdulillah, a lot of my brothers, uh, you know, uh, friends from the past were in Jahiliya practicing Islam now, and they had amazing hearts, uh, may Allah guide us all. But uh, what it is that if anyone saw me, and they wanted to call me towards, you know, doing something, you know, that is against the Quran and Sunnah. When they would see my beard and the towel, they would be like, you know, this brother now is he's crossed that boundary, he's on a different level. 
You know, so it becomes a natural repellent, subhanAllah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a blessing. And uh, this is why I encourage all the youngsters to do this, to get away from the, that bad crowd and to, to basically protect yourself. It's like a shield, right? But the deeper issues, I remember I was attending this class um, and uh, the Sheikh mentioned, he was mentioning these things. So it may sound a bit harsh, but I really liked it when I pondered on it. He goes, it's easy to a certain extent, but it's difficult at the same time, but then you can wear a thobe, you can grow the beard, and then you can learn, you know, a bit of Arabic and, you know, these lingo. That's how the Shaykh described it. You can say, Jazakallah khair, mashallah. But he goes, that the heart inside, you know, the soul inside could take years and decades to purify. Right? And he goes, it's like an old bin in your garden, rusty bin, that you will have to clean and so on. And he was just giving an example. And this is why, this is why we see brothers and sisters that are practicing but they still have these deep um, underlying issues. This conditioning, because imagine you've been around a very abusive family who have, you know, there's a lot of domestic violence at home. There was um, people who've been abused, you know, physically abused. These things won't go away overnight. Yeah. So this is why sometimes people hang on to these little escape mechanisms, which are very damaging and you need to be dealing with them, inshallah. Um, so the recovery aspect, that's why we say, you know, um, they say the wolf attacks the lone sheep, right? He won't go for the, uh, the main crowd, right? He'll get the one who is straying away. So this is why we say, like, at my Tazkiyah, alhamdulillah, there's many recovery programs out there. Um, but we say you have to join a support network. For those who are struggling with this addiction, this message is to you. you know, I want to talk a bit about the cure. And if you know someone who is struggling with this problem, you can give this message to them as well. You have to jo join a support group, a jama'ah. See, the way we go, you see I say, salah is the thing that keeps us connected to our deen, keeps us connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I wasn't reading uh, salah, especially in jama'ah in the masjid, that's one of my main connections to deen. You meet brothers, you see older individuals, you know, 70 year olds reading fajr and you know, it motivates you, you see little children, and then you're around that good crowd, you're around the environment of the Malaika, the environment of the angels, and you know, there's the rules taking place, you'll hear about these things, and then we go. This is the, the um, concept of Juma Khutbah, is to remind us, give that weekly reminder to recharge our Iman and these things. Likewise, someone who is struggling with addiction, you need the accountability and awareness aspect. And you need to you know, join a Jama'ah that is working on this goal together. People who have been where you've been, people who are struggling or have overcome the struggle that you are going through and can advise you and have seen the traps of the shaitan, of the qareen, of the inner addict and can advise you likewise. So that's one of the important things. You know, our program is like eight stages and alhamdulillah it was created by, we have, we have a team alhamdulillah. So a variety of brothers who have contributed to this, alhamdulillah, we have some psychotherapists working with us, coaches, um, you know, who do therapy work and uh, who do coaching as well. Uh, and there's sisters as well, there's female coaches, alhamdulillah. And uh, unfortunately, there's sisters as well. I mean, you know, it's difficult for them to reach out, but we can't judge, you know, we can't be at my tazkiyah anyway. We don't come from a place of judgment because, you know, you have to come from a place of love, from a place of treatment and be able to see the person as afflicted with the disease and addiction. And sometimes that is how they need to get worked on. Alhamdulillah, we get sisters as well suffering from this problem. And we have the females that deal with that side of things. Um, so it is very important to join a recovery group. Uh, that's one of the beginning stages to reach out. We say to start reaching out and start mentioning these problems because you know, and that's the thing. For a Muslim nowadays, it's easier to deal with the problem of alcoholism. It's more easier for them to get help with the alcohol addiction. It's more easier for them to get help with drug addiction than these other fitting of indecent images and videos because there's a stigma attached, there's a taboo. It's a taboo. Um, but you know, you have to break isolation and get that help. And we say, you know, we say you have to reach out and you have to start because you see, like I describe it like an electrical circuit. Imagine an addict yeah, as an electrical circuit, their lifestyle. That electrical circuit with active addiction, it's built in a certain way that it's firing up the addiction lifestyle. So what we want to do is cut that electrical circuit, cut their lifestyle, their conditioning, how they think, how they view the world, their behavioral patterns, their emotions, 
cut that, disrupt them as much as possible to weaken the addiction and then rewire that electrical circuit in a sobriety based way, you know, replace that with a sobriety lifestyle. So that's why we encourage individuals about reaching out and to be accountable. So a lot of people when they join our program, we give them accountability partners like a brother. You need to call this brother and just be accountable on a daily basis. You know, you wake up in the morning, you work together. You know, I'm going to university. I just want to check in and I've done this. I've done my, you know, um, worksheets. I've done the exercises. I've gone gym and uh, just want to connect because what happens you see the waswas is coming someone who has been watching this material or someone who has been addicted to weed for years decades their neural pathways synapses they're built in a way where it's always attacking them go watch this go do that go smoke weed go smoke cigarettes every time they feel stressful anxious this is what is going on yeah and we want to redirect those neural pathways you know they say the brain the rewiring aspect of the brain alhamdulillah the brain is plastic yeah there's a plasticity of the brain and this is why alhamdulillah you see people can get rid of their drug addiction people get cured from heroin addiction from alcohol addiction right from first and foremost from by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and people come to deen and they get rid of the addiction overnight Allah changes their hearts but you have to also constantly work on this rewiring aspect so instead of you getting the waswas for the addiction you call someone, you call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah protect me from this. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ My success is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't cure myself from this. Right? Only you can protect me. And we encourage, Alhamdulillah, look, we talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day in our salah. And a lot of us probably do our azkar as well, morning and evening azkar. But we want to go beyond that. You see, we try to encourage individuals to talk to Allah throughout the day. Especially when you are struggling with this. The waswas is strong. When you are struggling with the stress, the anxiety, uh, uh, the depression, you talk to Allah and this is how you connect with Allah. Because Allah is the healer, right? He is a shafi. And He is the one who cures. So you call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, I answer the call of the caller when He calls. Right? It's a promise. No dua goes rejected. Allah is always listening to us. He says, I am near. And I respond. SubhanAllah. So, you know, it actually becomes a blessing in disguise. You know, these addictions, people say that when they have recovered from these addictions and so on, they say it's one of the best things that has happened to them. SubhanAllah. A lot of you lot may seem like this may uh, seem awkward, but people say that it's allowed me to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and imagine now you're getting this was was go do this inappropriate thing go watch this un uh, inappropriate material and now you become into a habit where you're making dua every time the was was comes you're making dua right and you're getting rewarded for that and Allah's listening to your dua and Allah's answering your dua right so this is another part of the program where we try to work on but before I get to that, there's a stage where we say fix your daily routine. You see, like for all of us, addicts, non-addicts, we have to look at our daily routine. That is the basis, the fundamentals of our life. What are we doing on our daily routine? And again, you'll see these patterns. Not with everyone, but this is our experience again. With addicts, you'll see these patterns. Waking up late into the night, going to sleep late, waking up, sorry, you know, uh, going to sleep late waking up late sometimes a lot of them will have food addictions drinking too much fizzy drinks energy drinks coffee uh, gaming and you see again it's similar parts of the brain that you're dealing with so you know initially obviously if you're coming off weed alcohol this stuff then you have to work on the main aspect like okay because some people have to use it as a substitute initially so they may go to these other things you know just to uh, while they're detoxing from these extreme addictions but you also have to start watching your caffeine intake, your sugar intake because it is part of the, that part of the brain right? so it can trigger other addictions yeah. so these uh, things, right, um, as I was mentioning, the daily routine 
So we again, we encourage that as soon as you wake up, you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you start with Fajr, uh, you know, you, 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 you read your Adhkar, your Adhkar as sabah and you call out to Allah. Because there's this stage of detox, this withdrawal period with addictions. Uh, people say 30 to 90 days, one month, three months, or after 30 days, it t- tends to get a lot easier. So initially, we try to put all that uh, focus on that addiction. So we say, wake up. As soon as you open your eyes, you make dua, Ya Allah, protect me today from this addiction. Keep me sober from this addiction. Put all your effort into this problem. Because just a couple of days ago, you know, one um, brother mentioned, uh, there's another brother, a sister contacted him, a wife of a husband, right? And she said that the husband men- um, the husband has this addiction. And unfortunately, he has to watch this inappropriate material in order to get intimate with her, subhanAllah. And it's so powerful. You know, the brain has been bonded to this addiction. And we get a lot of, uh, you know, sisters contacting us about the husband's problems, unfortunately. So this is why we're so passionate and we try to kind of um, really talk about these subjects and work on the prevention aspect of things or even the, uh, you know, the cure. Um, so that daily routine, you have to look at your daily routine. And something, you know, I also suggest every morning you wake up, make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do a gratitude list. Yeah, even like, you know, we're told that from the deen, Allah says those who are grateful, he grants them more. And even from a psychology aspect, we're told that, you know, um, according to research and so on, that it makes people more happier, more peaceful, it better their day. So every day you wake up, you can do a gratitude list. Ya Allah, I'm grateful for simple things sometimes, you know, things that we take for granted. Ya Allah, I'm grateful for my eyes. Ya Allah, I'm grateful for my arms, my legs. I'm grateful for my home. I'm grateful for my bed. I'm grateful for my parents. I'm grateful for my wife. I'm grateful for my husband, my children. I'm grateful for the food that I have in the fridge. I'm grateful for, um, you know, the heating. And some people say I'm grateful for my car. I'm grateful that I have insurance on my car. It's these things that we take for granted, but it's a ni'mah, it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you do this, you naturally be more happier because you stop focusing on the things that other people may have and you don't have and you know it's just a vicious cycle so when you're being grateful you're just focusing on the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and you walk out the home happy connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we say you know call uh, brothers uh, throughout the day connect because another thing we see with addiction there's this lack of connection people are isolated um, a lot of brothers that are in our program, they won't have a masjid because you know, alhamdulillah we have um, brothers from all across the world so a lot of them don't have a masjid, they don't have brothers around them or sisters may not have good uh, sisters around them and these kind of things so create that environment, work on that environment you know, an idle mind is the devil's workshop so the more connected you are, the more connected you are to the masjid going to the duru, studying your deen and you know, you see this there's this dopamine substitution aspect as well. Um, I'll talk about that at the end. So now to come to the more important parts, uh, just keep an eye on the time, shall The more important parts of recovery, where we see that people have this distorted relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. All right. So we work on these aspects of Deen, the fundamentals of our Deen, such as Tawheed, Husn al thinking good of Allah, having this good relationship with Allah, tawakkal in Allah, trust in Allah. And these things, because you see a lot of addicts, they are filled with fear. They are filled with anxieties and, you know, always on the edge. Imagine like someone walking on thin ice, treading on thin ice. A person who has anxiety, he's feeling like this all the time, right? And he will have these chest pains, she will have these chest pains and these kind of things. But um, Dealing with both aspects, the mental health aspect of things and the deen aspect of things. And we see that there's this lack of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lack of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lack of tawakkal in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you know, when you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever relies on me, I am sufficient for them. And that should be enough for us from cradle to the grave. Whoever relies on Allah, he is sufficient. 
Allah is telling us. But it's hard. It's hard when you have this conditioning and when the Qareen has manipulated your mind, it's hard to think like that. And that's where we need to work on these things. We need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal our brains, heal our conditioning, and take a conscious effort to change. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that He does not change the situation of a people until they change what is within themselves. So we can't expect for things to be changed overnight. We have to take those steps to change, inshallah. And Allah does the rest. Yeah. So you know these things that you have to work on that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear, for instance. You know, one scholar was mentioning that fear could be a minor form of shirk. Because fear only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, fear is an attribute that only Allah is deserving of. And obviously there's natural fear. If you see a car in front of you speeding at you, you're gonna feel fear. That's different. Someone's got a gun to your head, you're gonna feel fear. That's natural fear. But this excessive fear, financial worries, worries about the world, you know, fearing mankind. You know, Allah says, fear me and not them. Right? And these kind of things. And this is why the scholar says that when you give this attribute that only belongs to Allah, to the creation, this could be a minor form of shirk, subhanAllah. Only Allah is worthy of fear. And I remember another person telling me that fear is not trusting Allah. When you are in a state of fear, there is something going on there. Your tawakkal, your trust in Allah, there is a distortion there. Right? So, this is the thing, like one brother um, I dealt with, he had this story that initially when he came to Islam, came from this background of jahiliya, drugs, alcohol, drug dealing. And when he came, he also had this uh, addiction of inappropriate material. And he was free from it for a year. And when he would talk, he would say that in that year, right, I had a very strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was frequenting the masjid and I was connected to uh, a good crowd, good brothers. And I walked, although he was like from a background of gangs and gangs affiliated and so on. And he said, but I had issues even when I started practicing, but I felt like fearless. And he mentioned these verses of the Quran that, you know, if the whole of mankind were to get together to harm you, um, they can't, right? In my own words, to paraphrase it. And if they were to benefit you, they can't benefit you. If they were to harm you, the whole of mankind get together to harm you, they can't. Without Allah's permission. And he would have that sakina, that contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then after a year, life got busy. He got slightly disconnected with Allah, away from the masjid, away from the crowd. And you see, that's the way the lone sheep was attacked, right, by the wolf. Um, so this is what we try to bring in again. We try to bring that connection, that daily connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about your problems. Throughout the day, through every difficulty, every struggle, you had a bad day at work, you're coming back from your day at work in your car, and you know, you've had a bad argument with your boss or a colleague, start talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about it. Tell Allah how you feel about the situation. Ya Allah, I'm feeling very stressed, anxious, and I feel vulnerable towards my addiction. Ya Allah, protect me. You know, and this really lightens that burden. Right? A problem shared, a burden shared is half as heavy. Right? So when you talk, to, when you get into this habit, start off by trying to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala twice a day. Once when you're going to school, when you're going to study, when you're going to work, and once when you're coming back uh, from work, and you know, start off like this. But there should be never, never be a time where we are not connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the day. Start to study Tawheed. Right? Real reliance on Allah. That success is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawheed al rububiyyah that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, this is the uh, aspects of Tawheed, right, you know, about Lordship and so on, that Allah is the one who gives and Allah is the one who takes. Allah is the one who cures. Allah is the one who gives money and can take uh, money. Allah is the one who gives life and only He can take life. Allah is the one who protects. These things that we have to get used to and remind ourselves on a daily basis about the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connect with Him. We don't need no intermediaries. We don't need no third person. We have a direct connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You call unto him and he will respond. The creator of the world, of the heavens and the earth. You have this direct relationship. And this is the best of relationships we have. 
and we must really take care of this relationship every other relationship will eventually uh, be gone right? our relationship with our siblings relationship with our parents right eventually you know people have to leave this world right you know your mother your father may Allah give all our parents long righteous lives they may pass away you know your spouse may leave you uh, again may Allah protect us you may be divorced your spouse may leave you it happens right and you know all these things can happen but Allah is always there in the dunya in the barzak and the akhirah he is the being that will always be with you right and this is a relationship we have to cherish and work on and then there's uh, the aspect of um, really deep diving into the, the conditioning right dealing with the underlying mental health issues that are driving the addiction and for this you could do different things you know we have like um, exercises similar to cognitive behavioral therapy um, or journaling yet yeah, again to simplify it start journaling your feelings on a daily basis right because when you journal it's like you're doing a mini therapy session on yourself if you are suffering especially if you are suffering from issues such as anger stress anxiety addictions you need to start writing down the way we treat our degrees we give so much time to study 30 40 hours a week maybe we pay thousands and thousand pounds we work 40 50 60 hours a week to provide for our families likewise if you are suffering from these issues that are destroying your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have to give time and you have to work on these issues even if you are suffering from other mental health issues start journaling by journaling you are tapping into your subconscious mind and start writing down what is happening before you are having the fit of anger what is happening before you feel angry what is happening uh, what is causing the stress what is making you actions anxious what is causing you to act out your addiction because remember i said that there's always a process that takes place an emotion cannot come into existence without a thought process so we have to start learning about this thought process learning about conditioning and it reminds me of a quote where uh, it is mentioned watch your thoughts for your thoughts become your intentions watch your intentions for they become your uh, behaviors right watch your behavior for that becomes your character and watch your character for that becomes your destiny and forget all the rest let's focus on the thought and intention part between the thoughts and the intentions because once you've made an intention to do haram it's very unlikely that you're going to stay away from it so you have to prevent the thought becoming that intention and this is where you can work on the mental health aspect of things a lot of um, people alhamdulillah we have the NHS here so if anyone is suffering from these mental health conditions you can go to your local GP and be um, referred to talking therapies where you can do a bit of cognitive behavioral therapy with a professional and there are Muslim organizations like Mataskia we are one of them there's a lot of Muslim professionals out there alhamdulillah and uh, it's probably better to have someone who can understand your culture and you know the Dean aspect of things because sometimes um, it's, it's a bit more catered towards you um, and uh, you know I'll just encourage if you're suffering from this problem you do that and another part is meditation we try to focus on meditation and we're not talking about you know when we say meditation a lot of people like you know get a bit scared the thing that you know meditation monks Buddhists we're not talking about that meditation where you have to uh, meditate for like 5,000 hours at a temple or something right we're talking about learning to live in the present moment learning to be there in the now because a lot of us again we have these racing thoughts the waswas and we are hardly present in the moment children are very present you see when I take my son to school I just give an example it's easy to remember and it's raining and he steps on puddles he notices these puddles and they're enjoying the moment but I ask some people when I work one-to-one -one with people I say what was the last time you remember seeing a puddle of uh, water on the floor and they'll say when I was a child or years ago then I say when was the last time you remember you're making wudu do you remember the water going down the sink 
You'd be like, no. Why? Because I was thinking about work. I was thinking about studies. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about that. And no one's present in the moment. So like this, you know, this is something that we say, this is the kind of presence, awareness, living in the moment, meditation we talk about. For when you make wudu for Isha, or when we are praying Isha Jama over here, let's try to have khushu and be focused in the moment. You know, connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's only, again, because there's this wiring of the brain. Because as children, we are very present because, you know, we don't have much to worry about. And then when we grow older, there's GCSEs and then A-levels and then university and then work and all these responsibilities come. So, you know, we are always worried, like thinking, thought processes. In the morning, wake up, letters just don't leave us alone. SubhanAllah, you know, just the letters. You know, they give us anxiety, this letter there, that letter there. Then you go to work and you're thinking, you're always thinking, thinking, thinking. And we're hardly in the present moment. There's a time for thinking and you can write a to-do list and so on. But, you know, there's other ways to kind of work on, on, on getting things done. But start focusing on living in the now. The next shower that, you know, your brothers have, be there in the now. Focus on the water, you know, going on your body. Focus, you know, these are because what it is to become present, to go into the present moment, there's different channels. There's sense perceptions, yeah, smelling. What smelling, uh, the, the, the sense of smell is a very powerful way to channel yourself in the present moment. And you'll see that sometimes we love good smell, right? The Prophet ﷺ loved good smells, right? Like perfumes and so on. But when you smell a perfume, sometimes you have strong memories of the past. Or uh, you'll have this feeling, this good feeling. Through smell, you become present. It brings you into the moment. Uh, another way is um, through touching. Right? Sometimes when you touch things or say for instance you're uh, in the park in summer you know, touching the, the plants or you're in the beach swimming you're touching, it brings you into the present moment you're at the gym right? Why do all of us humans like these things that give us this, um, these, this adrenaline rush people go to the fun phase and bungee jumping, skydiving a lot of people are just trying to escape their mind you know, the prison of their mind but alhamdulillah, you have these healthy coping mechanisms or um, way to release these feel-good hormones. Gym, boxing, right? There's a lot of things I encourage the youngsters because it's a very important part of recovery from addiction, uh, dopamine substitution. Because when you're taking away something that is very dear to the mind, right? Let's be real, you know, the weed, the alcohol, all these addictions, the brain loves it. So when you're taking this thing away, you need to replace it with something. You can't just take it away. It's like you're taking a toy of a child and you need to replace it with something. Distract the child. Like, again, an example I can give is with my son. You know, you take something off him. Uh, you can't say, don't do this. Musa, don't do this. No, you have to say, you have to distract. Right? And we all fall short of this. We do this a lot. And I, we remind each other, you know, my, me and my wife, that distraction, distract. Don't say no, distract. Musa, let's do this, let's do that. So you distract. Likewise with addiction, you, you're taking away this addiction, you have to replace it. So, replace it with gym. And one of the best replacements is Deen. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Again, a lot of brothers, they come from Jahiliya, certain environments, and they love studying. They study Arabic. They study, they, do, they start doing hifs. They start doing, you know, these Islamic courses. They go abroad because that's a beautiful replacement. The Deen is the best of replacements. And that is part of dopamine substitution. You know, you're releasing dopamine when you're studying and you're learning and you're around these good environments. Secondly, I encourage brothers to get into sports. Gym. Gym is one of the powerful ways it releases these feel-good hormones. Jiu-Jitsu is a very uh, famous sport nowadays. Alhamdulillah, one brother was telling me the other day that since you know, he's suffering from this pornography problem and since he started doing Jiu-Jitsu, now, instead of him fantasizing about those things, he's fantasizing about choking people out, doing this move, that move, you know, in, in jiu-jitsu, basically, you know, it's, it's all technical, isn't it? And uh, he's, he's got his mind busy with these things. Or boxing, right? Uh, you know, body sparring or something, or these exercise classes, whatever it is, you need to release that dopamine and substitute this energy transmutation needs to take place. And then going back to the present, you know, l learn to be present in the moment, and the way to do that is your sense perceptions, as I was talking about, smelling, 
touching, hearing. Right? When we hear, sometimes I've had sessions and we're on this stage of meditation and I ask brothers, what can you hear right now? Let's go quiet. Look, let's just have 10 seconds silence. What can we hear right now? A lot of you guys might find this awkward because the brain, you know, it, it doesn't like silence and it loves the thought process and so on. But when I went silent, what could you guys hear? When, when, we, when I stopped talking? Children. Children playing downstairs, right? Likewise, uh, when I talked to brother, he said, I can hear the engines of cars going by. I can hear birds tweeting. Uh, they haven't said this, but these are the kind of things you may notice. Or I say, what can you see in front of you? And a brother's in his bedroom. I can see the, this color in my bedroom. Like, you know, I've never kind of seen it this way, this color. Seen it from a new point of view, subhanAllah. And we, you know, is there so much enjoyment because you're cutting that thought process. You're cutting those patterns, those patterns that are causing the anxiety, the stress, the addictions and that. So sometimes we slow down and you know SubhanAllah when we read Quran, it's a very powerful way. You're in the moment. Or maybe some people even suffer, with, uh, suffer from waswas there, but generally it slows down the mind. Right, so there's a sense perception which all of you can use is, um, what did I start off with? Smelling, touching, uh, hearing, playing the Quran. These kind of things, or just being in nature, is very powerful, right? When we go to the, the park, we start hearing natural sounds, or seeing one of the most powerful ones, you know, just looking up at the sky, it'll give you this sense of peace, seeing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes seeing a the sunset, these things. Uh, again, we emphasize this because those thought processes are so strong, so we have to emphasize these to the individuals that are struggling with these racing thoughts and so on. Um, and then the final stage is to basically help them implement the, this recovery lifestyle in their day-to-day -day life, inshallah. So I think we've kind of um, come to the end of the session. Uh, just wanted to thank you all, um, thank Brother Harun uh, and Nottingham Islam for inviting us. Uh, but just before I finish, I just want to ask, what are the takeaways from this session that you can give, you know? one or two points that you can advise another brother struggling with this issue or as a father what are you going to do what did i say that you can talk to your son about this um or the application the filter application if you can remember any takeaways that you brothers want to mention just so we get it into our mind i think that apps that you mentioned yeah custodial also yes. when you're in stress you have to divert your mind from one scenario to another scenario. 100 so rewiring your brain. Rewiring the brain. Very important part. Jazakallah khair. Anyone else? If you're addicted to, some, to do something that you have intention, you can read the Quran, or you can pray to Allah. Yes. To connect with Allah. To connect with Allah. Jazakallah khair. Anyone else? Can I mention any points? Bismillah. Yeah. Yeah. Whole, whole process is this prevention and awareness. Yeah. Uh, for the prevention, for the main thing, first in order to contact uh, yeah. the internet provider and you do the first layer of prevention, then after that we go to the custodian, then the matter of awareness, and also to just when we cut off something, you have to feed it. Like yeah. To replace it. Replace it. 100%. Uh, this one is very important, I think. Uh, the issue of the spiritual issue as well. And I think for me, just the most important thing in order to get someone coaching you know, the, uh, the accountability part, that yeah. helps a lot because someone cannot control himself. Yes, so yes. Uh, that one is, I think, the, uh, the key. And the, uh, yes, it's a very for, powerful for, for part. The cure, for the cure process. Very powerful aspect of recovery. Jazakallah. Father Sheikh, you were mentioning something. Yeah, yeah. The Sheikh has mentioned Same thing. about the, the thoughts. Yeah. To be mindful of the thoughts. Yeah. To remind the, the youth about what they to be mindful of what they are doing. Yes. To take the as a parent to take the, the normal process. Yeah. And to make them to be aware that when they are doing things uh, to be 
to for them to be to be to know that we also can they, we can they can be yeah. trace in a way just as you mentioned yeah. they about the application and stuff like that yeah that they can can know what they are doing so they should be aware of that and they should also know that Allah is seeing them so yeah Jazakallah khair. So yeah, just uh, alhamdulillah, great takeaways. Just two points. One is for the fathers, uh, and the mothers, all the children. That you you talk to your children about this, right? If you see something explicit, come up on the screen. Uh, you know, give them these options so it sticks in their brain. A, are you going to click on this pop up? B, are you going to close this pop up? Or C, are you going to talk to me about it? And tell them to talk to you about it. Get them comfortable from the prevention aspect. And the second thing is. I like to set targets, you know, we are driven by targets. So I just want to give a deadline that by today or tomorrow night, everyone get your devices filtered, right? Whether that's contacting your internet service provider or uh, downloading Custodial uh, and uh, filtering your websites and protecting inshallah. So I'll just end it there, Jazakallah khair. And um, I'll hand it over to Brother Harun if they wanted to do any questions or something. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much, Brother Abu Musa, for your insightful uh, advice and lecture. <coughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, so what I wanted to say was, you know, as a parent, uh, mother or father, it's very, very important that we try our best to, you know, obviously if we've got children, we try our very best to get them married as, as early as possible. You know, this can uh, help prevent um, committing a, a lot of sins, you know, uh, a rainbow of sins. So try to support them, get them married off as quick as possible. I know some parents like to think about their children's education where they wish for them to go to university, spend three to four years doing a particular subject, uh, graduating in a particular field, and then they can think about getting married. But me as a parent, I would, I would advise that you try and get them married even before they graduate graduate in a, in a particular university even whilst they are studying even when they're like 19 20 21 years old you can still help them and support them in getting married um, you know by all means try to help them find someone if they manage to find someone in their university setting and they approach you and they and they um, they, they obviously inform you they they tell you that they found someone that they're interested in give them that support don't don't try to shove it under the table and oh we'll talk about it later or anything like that I think it's best if you talk about it there and then and help support or help facilitate that marriage even if they're still studying at, at the university because they can still have a relationship you know, um, under marriage, under an Islamic marriage, and they can still study at the same time. That's that's not a problem. But support them. But, but it's just some parents don't think like that. Some parents are more of a thinking where, no, my son or daughter has to graduate first, and by the time they graduated, they're like 25, 26 years old, and then they can think about marriage. But Allah knows best what they've been doing from the age of maturity, whatever that would be. Uh, up until 25, 26 years old, you don't know how many sins, how many hidden sins they've been committing within that time frame. So, yeah, do talk to your children about this, especially when they get to the mature age of 17, 18 years old. These are the times that you need to be very close with them and um, talk about these issues issues to them as well. Uh, there are a few questions, Abu Musa, so, so I'd like you to answer these. They're not really related to the topic tonight but one of them is from a new Muslim and she just wants to know some basic things so if you can just give some brief answers sure um, what if we missed the prayer can we still pray later and is it still invalid or is it valid now if it's like um Obviously, there's a timing for prayer, but what these kind of questions, I think they're better directed at uh, like a scholar or you know someone with knowledge. So I really don't want to go into like specific Islamic because I'm not I'm not you know anyone of uh, kind of knowledge you know deal with the, those other aspects of things. But generally, and maybe someone who's knowledgeable can answer that because I know the answer, but probably you know someone who's more knowledgeable, inshallah, can can deal with that. 
I mean, obviously, I knew I knew these. Uh, well, I knew Abu um, Abu Musa would say this anyway, or respond like this anyway. Exactly. But um, because he's not an imam or uh, yeah. an alim. No. But I thought I'd just go through the matter of respect no, exactly anyway, right. because exactly uh, right. it, you know, just say new Muslim on the top, so you know, she probably she probably, probably want to yeah, thought it for them, innit? Mm -hmm. Answer by someone, inshallah. Yeah, by all means, sister. Um, if you uh, want answers to these questions, then uh, come and see our Imam. Imam is a dean, and he will answer these for you, inshallah. Um, he's normally here for all the salawat, for all the prayers. Uh, Isha will be at quarter past eight, inshallah, so in about fifteen minutes. Um, we can also provide you these answers through the sisters as well anyway, sure. uh, for, through the sisters downstairs. Uh, any other questions before we close? Any other pieces of advice? Any other I problems? Want, yes, go on Sudhir. Yes, brother. Want, you, you, want, you just told us to say what we, yeah. we, we gain from us. Yes. Sure. yes sure. Uh, very educative and I summarize in a simple word, cup. C U P. Yeah. C stands for concentration. Yeah. U stands for understanding, mm -hmm. and P stands for practicing. Mm -hmm. So what you are saying is that um, you have educated me personally, and mm -hmm. my intention was that there is a very big problem in our Muslim community, specifically. In my country, yeah. a lot of children are addicted, they have been sent to this uh, cocaine, uh, mm -hmm. and a very big number of the East African Muslims have been affected with these things. And uh, I was trying, I have a lot of people who they know you, they may think I may ask so many questions because I'm trying to look for a solution. Mm -hmm on helping those children. Big number of the community. So it is, you have said on the, because most of the people, like now you can think is the pornographic or this one, but 90% to me, people are addicted with money, with wealth. <coughs> so if they don't get what they want, if you ask 90% of the immigrants that came here because they want money, they're addicted to money. So how can we take them from that addiction? Because at the moment, it's a necessary thing they need for their life. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I, I was very curious listening to you on the, on the kind of the solution you want to say. Yeah. What, what would you advise on that? Yeah, this is um, a struggle that we all may face. You know, it's, a, it's again, it's human emotion. Uh, you, call it, you call it greed. Everyone of us will suffer from, from time to time. And I think the best solution, again, is our deen. Right? Maybe a lot of these people are uh, not that connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're, They're on deen. They're on deen. Practicing. Well, I would say then there needs to be a deeper level of connection to Allah. Because person who is connected to Allah and who is studying the Quran and Sunnah, will uh, try to navigate these things. Again, look, these are human emotions. Like example, I give jealousy. <clears throat> Every one of us will feel jealous uh, from time to time. People will get jealous at their own family members. But what I say is sometimes we pay too much emphasis on that human emotion. Sometimes it comes, you acknowledge it. Okay, this, this thought, again, remember the thought processes. Thoughts, emotions come and go. We stay. <clears throat> these are temporary, they're like clouds. They float by. We can't grab them. Let them float by. So the jealousy will come. And sometimes people feel like, I'm practicing. I'm a righteous brother, righteous sister. Why am I feeling jealous? And they start creating this inner turmoil. The easy way to deal with it, this thought of jealousy came. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim This thought came. It's not me. It's coming from an external entity. Remember, we all have this qareen. And that allows it to dissolve by not judging it. Because when you start judging it, that judgment also sometimes is coming from that was worse. Why am I feeling this way? They want to remember that fisherman example I gave. It only the fish will only come and get caught if there's a bait, and that bait is in a turmoil. You know, distress and anxiety. Likewise, this issue of money, inshallah, you know, the best thing you can do is to constantly keep connected to Allah, make adhkar, and remember even the, the, the um, saying of the Prophet. 
I believe where he said, you know, in, in Deen, you look up to people in Deen, and uh, right when you uh, see someone with, uh, you know, if, if, if it's dunya, uh, dunya-wise stuff, you look at people who are less than you. So that is a solution we are given by the Prophet ﷺ. Be grateful. And these kind of things, inshallah. I think also, you know, when people do come from poorer countries or less wealthier countries to the richer countries, just to earn a better living, there's nothing wrong with that, obviously, essentially. It's just, um, they've just got to maintain their, their level of Iman. They've really got to maintain, because what they're going to be facing when they come to these uh, better off countries is a lot of fitting, a lot of trials, a lot of, tr you know, tests. And obviously the Western world, we know it, it, it's got a lot of harmful things that, that obviously, that, that happens to us. Uh, because what you say, these four days I've been with somebody, sent my car, somebody from Iraq. He told me his father, his grandfather, a big sheikh, but he ended up to come to England and he's doing some cars. And he said, his father, 20 years back, he told him, don't go to Europe. Because there they are going to implement the idea men to men, women to women. So the chief, the boy, now he's uh, 30 something, he's a, he has big business here in, in Nottingham. He told me, we all we were sitting in the bar, I said, is our father now, yeah? He said, no, you see. Now he said, we, we fight it to come to Europe. Our father was telling us to leave, so we were addicted because we were seeing everybody come back to Iran, Iraq, oh, people are in Germany, England, we can't, we fight it to come here. So to me, I feel we end up, we, it's an issue about uh, the pornographic, other things, <coughs> but there is addiction in the present world of looking at different level of life. Yeah. So how can we satisfy these human beings? I don't think so you can help everybody in the Sunni. Yeah. There's, 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 it's impossible. You can't help. No, you no, it's not to, you know, I think there is, uh, you know, maybe I can tell you the, the method is that I'm trying to work it out. Is that what you say? To, like there is better man, educational, you know, orphans, you understand? Mm. So that those people, they get, is that the word they told you, con cap, concentration, understanding, and practicing. Mm -hmm. Constant repetition of proper technique brings the best results. Constant yep. repetition of proper technique brings yep. the best yep. results. That's a very philosophical statement yep. said by a very educated Muslim scholar. Yep. Constant repetition of proper technique brings the best results. So now this is what we are fighting for. But you see, what, what you're describing there, Sudi, is it's got to come from a governmental level. It's got to come from the top down, okay? Because, for example, uh, Abu Musa's got his project in London that's helping the Muslim community. There should be thousands of these projects up and down the country, not just one here and there. But if it was a governmental level, there would be a project like this in every city, or in every village, or every town. Are we gonna do, what, sorry, maybe uh, my country, Kenya, 70% are Christians, 30% are Muslims. Yeah. Yes, sir. And the Muslims are the ones, our youth are being affected. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So the right. government, no matter what, they are not going, they are not going to support us. Yeah. They want us to, to be finished. Yes. Allah protect the Muslim Union. Amen. Yes. Do you get the protection? Yeah, sure. So it's we'll end it here because of the Shabbat. 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 Is it alright if I just mention the website? Anyone on the website of email? Yeah, yours. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Just one second. Yes. Just um, wanted to mention, maybe online people know, but if you know anyone struggling with this, or if anyone needs help, then you can visit our website, 
uh, on www.mytaskia.com or email us on info at mytaskia.com. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah.